Hey, Ryan Kleftinger from Fortnite. Um, in North America, Zero and Livewire have both been slashing prices for $8,000. In the UK, electric motorcycle sales were down 38% last year, down 20% in Italy, down 20% in Spain, 7% in France. Why do you want to get into this now? Hello, I'm Ryan F9, and this is the Can-Am Origin and Pulse, or Origin and Pulse. Well, either way, this is going to be Canada's first mass-produced electric motorcycle since Damon failed to build theirs. But this is going to be the first electric motorcycle that reboots a legacy brand, since Buell's fuel thing never arrived. Uh, but this satisfies BRP's promise to have an EV in all eight vehicle categories by 2026. The boldest of the industries... Actually, Honda promised 30 by 2030. The Canadian government promised 100% of new vehicles by 2035. Does anyone else have EV fatigue? And I feel like every year we're asked to care about five new electric motorcycles that are legally bound to define our future. And well, every year, half of them go bankrupt. The other half sells so few that manufacturers try to hide their existence behind the next promise. Above all, do you have a gathering sense that battery electric motorcycles just aren't working? Faith in the battery breakthrough is waning. I'm sitting on 8.9 kilowatt hours, so I'd need precisely a 50 minute piss, precisely every 130 kilometers at precisely a level 2 charging station to use it as anything more than a toy. And the 35 kilowatt peak power outputs, that's uh, in meat terms, 47 horsepower. It's kind of like a mid range zero, kind of like half a live wire, kind of like a 1959 Bonneville. Unadjustable KYB forks are inelegant. Single 320 millimeter J1 brakes are inelegant. Elegance is inelegant. It's the same boring take. 21700 cells are so expensive you have to round every other corner to squeeze into the market below 15,000 or borrow 300 million from Canadian taxpayers, which BRP didn't. They're not part of Bombard Z anymore. So this costs $18,299 up here. They're calling it a little commuter bike, but the passenger seat and foot pegs are sold separately? They're calling it a little commuter bike, but storage isn't big enough for one of my shoes. They're calling it a little commuter bike, and it is really little, yet not nimble, because the swing arm is so long. Why is the swing arm so long? And for a little commuter bike, the active regen is too annoying. Uh, you roll opposite, and it drags on the motor at what feels like a set rate. So at highway momentum, it's fine, though they limited this to 129 kph for range reasons, so that's hardly relevant. At city speeds, it's ugh, really intrusive. It hits all at once and then suddenly releases at a slow speed near zero, but you never quite know when. It's awkward. Even the styling is a miss. The 10 and a quarter inch iPad off the spiders is obviously too big. The clamshell for Apple CarPlay is comically too big. The vestigial neutral light is confusingly wrong. And the maker of Skidoo and Seadoo would use a substructure to cabinet up all the cables and hoses. I like that innovation. But still, when I think of canned hams, I think of the iconic flat tanks that bench right into the seat, a real personal visual memory for so many of us. But, I mean, it has a traditional tank despite not having a gas tank for Pierre's sake. Disappointingly tame considering the fast and bizarre history of canned hams. First, Bombardier buys Rotax, an Austrian company whose rotary valves make 40 horsepower while competitors are dicking around in the mid-20s with piston porting. The first Can-Am motorcycle is entered into the 1973 Six Days trial and wins gold and silver and bronze. In 74, their first motocross MX-1 takes gold in the AMA 250 championship and silver and bronze. Another pro, Jimmy Ellis, crashes one into a spectator and labels it a Black Widow. Can-Am briefly ships decals to that effect until dealers complain that no one wants to buy a murder machine, so Can-Am issues the industry's first and only recall for a sticker. Can-Am's final MX-4 is nicknamed the Orange Monster for its unrideable power delivery. And in 1983, Bombardier disowns the wild child, selling Can-Am and its unruly reputation overseas to die. So you can understand my disappointment in not getting a grizzly bear on wheels. I mean, where even is the motor? No, 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 
Oh. Rotax might not have the master key to horsepower anymore, but they do have mastery of karting motors, tiny electric karting motors. Just like before, Rotax does enable Can-Am to make a winning innovation. They engineered the motor inside of the swing arm. Which itself is actually the sealed chain case off a of Ski-Doo, bathed in oil, auto-tensioned, maintenance-free for 15,000 kilometers. The motor slash drivetrain slash swing arm is independent of everything. This is the motorcycle. And the rest is just a storage receptacle for your battery and your butt. What that means is BRP can tilt the entire power unit to bolt on a wildly different bike. The Origin. Here, the long swing arm, long because the motor is inside of it, is just more leverage for keeping the rear tire stuck to the dirt, and longer progression for slipping in and out of a drift. Here, the sealed chain case lets me hear every rock I throw and never worry about them landing in my final drive. And here, right here, is the easiest off-road power delivery of any adventure bike. With the motor and chain inside the swing arm, there's no slack to slacken as the suspension moves. There's no lash when you hit off whoops because the angle between the motor and the drive, it never changes. And think about that. We've thought about this before as the motor torques the wheel this way, being mounted in the swing arm, the torque reaction makes the whole thing wanna go that way. That's perfect anti-squat. It's only 61% on the pulse, but with the rotated power unit, anti-squat offsets 93% of weight transfer on the origin. That actively pushes the tire into traction, like on a T7. But with ice bikes, the anti-squat is mm, always changing because the angle between the counter sprocket and the wheel is always changing. But now, with the swing arm motor, it is always perfectly 93%. It never sags into its suspension to upset your balance, and it can never be persuaded overboard to jack the rear. The Origin rides like a child's imagination of how motorcycles go. No pitch, no weight transfer, just a rapid shift in X, an almost digital translation forward. And because it's electric, it has the weight and the width of a 300, but the low-end torque of a leader bike for swinging the rear out. That is a cheater combination for riding off-road, and you'll never care that the top end power is closer to a 600 because you can't put more than 40 HP into the dirt anyway. Now, I've never experienced two motorcycles on a shared platform that ride so differently, and that I feel so differently about, and even the styling. They're both modeled on a snow owl, and on this one, the color match wings complete the picture, and the pulse doesn't. The pulse is bad, and I hope I feel less biased for saying that, because as a Canadian, I'm so proud that the first Canadian motorcycle in 40 years is also the best adventure bike that I've ridden. And T7, Touareg, 890, Desert X, take your pick, I'm faster on this. There's just this one mm, mm, tiny little thing. It's unusable. Range on Nobbies is 115 kilometers. If I adventured 30 minutes from my apartment to the nearest trailhead, I'd be lucky to turn around and make it home. To see sense in the 100-click adventure bike, can -Am must be blinded by ideology. But remember, it's not a green ideology. It's gold. Entering an ultra-competitive market and immediately winning requires a cultish edge. In the 70s, Can-Am put everything on revolutionary power, betting that their chassis and suspension would catch up. In 2025, they're putting everything on a revolutionary power train and betting the battery density will catch up. Last time, Can-Am lost their bet. This time, hmm, well, I think their better hope is that the legal landscape catches up, banning gas bikes in cities, at which point Canon will be ready with the technology and the production line to dominate. They're scratch building those batteries for that purpose. That's their best hope, but it's not something I hope for. Of course, the alternative is that the best riding adventure bike will never be usable for an adventure. I'm hesitating to conclude. 
because I'm afraid of either answer. Thank you very much for watching. If I've earned it, I'd like you to hear a side story. BRP hosted their press launch in Valcour, Quebec. Joseph Armand Brabardier was born in Valcour. His son died in Valcour, so he invented the first snow car for doctors in Valcour. ski came from Valcour. ski Valcour. So of course Bombardier brought us all to see their design and innovation centers, which are still proudly in Valcour. Then they shuttled us 30 minutes away to hop on the bikes because a nice test loop from pavement to dirt you couldn't get there and back from Valcour. The Origins range isn't even enough for its own demo ride, so trust that Can-Am knows this is a problem. But what they chose to do is design the right size of battery to envelop in its liquid cooling cap with its performance controller to show us how singularly emboldening that type of bike can be to ride. I don't expect many will want to buy one at today's battery density, so please try someone else's with our sponsor, Ridershare. Being the Airbnb of bikes, Ridershare lets us tap into a vast network of other people's motorcycles. Try the Origin. I'm curious to hear how many riders would make that powertrain their first choice if one day we can get 400 kilometers into it. I would. Of course, there are no Can-Am motorcycles on Rider Share today. There are no Can-Am motorcycles anywhere but Valkyrie today. But sign up via the link below because Rider Share has the largest population of Can-Am three-wheelers for rent anywhere in the USA. It's only a matter of time until someone posts their Can-Am motorcycle to some early adopter. And it's a rare treat to ride a product that is truly made for a market that isn't here yet. Rare still if that market never arrives.